Well, how about we get started yeah. and we'll have uh, Karen join us when she can. Um, welcome to Law and Gospel. I'm Pastor Paul Kane from Sheridan, Wyoming, and it's a privilege to present again at CCLE, especially here in Fort Wayne. In the last few years since I've been asked to do this class, there's been a flurry of new books on Law and Gospel. And I'm always surprised when somebody takes something that we as Lutherans have cherished, that proper distinction, and wanting to do law and gospel right, and try to broaden its appeal, broaden its influence in the Christian world. So this is Mockingbird's book, Law and Gospel, A Theology for Sinners. And these folks say, there's a big difference between judgment and love, obligation and freedom, a wage and a gift. The difference characterizes an extraordinary amount of our day-to-day -day experience, often dividing fear from hope and death from life. At the heart of Christianity lies a similar and related dynamic between the law and the gospel. Far from being a reductive or antiquated distinction, understanding where one ends and the other begins, allows a person to see both the Bible and themselves, indeed the whole world, in a fresh and enlivening way. Written with a non-theologian in mind, this short volume unpacks the good news of God's grace with practicality, humor, and a whole lot of heart. Uh, due to time constraints, I prepared for three hour and a half sessions. We have an hour together, three times. I'll skip over some slides, but we'll have my PowerPoint available on the CCLE website. They're a group that was founded in 2007. Uh, the newest one is this one, The Art of Law and Gospel by R.J. Grunewald, and I found out he's a Missouri Synod SMP pastor. He says, one of the most dangerous problems plaguing the Christian church is the failure to distinguish law and gospel. These two words, law and gospel, are a gift from God. We need both words, but we need them for different re reasons. A clear understanding of law and gospel makes us acutely aware of our own sin problem and in awe of God's grace. A proper understanding of God's promises gives us hope when we have nothing to hope in, when everything is falling apart, and when we deserve punishment. He's in Troy, Michigan. So, Law and Gospel, in brief, uh, how is it revealed? We have the law written on the heart, also most clearly given in the Ten Commandments. It tells us what we are to do. It promises eternal life via perfect obedience. How are you doing on that today, even in the last 30 seconds? Failure means death. That's what James tells us. It tells us what to do, but does not give us the power to do it, and terrorizes us, leads us to rebel, um, or at least I'm doing better than that other guy. The audience, sinners secure in their sin, and the Ten Commandments is the clearest example of that. In contrast, the gospel revealed only in the scriptures, it tells us what God does for us no demands, and promises eternal life because of Christ. There are no threats, which is what makes gospel gospel. If you hear threats, it's not gospel, even if somebody tells you they're intending it as gospel. And the gospel gives what it demands, faith. It affects faith, comfort, and salvation is for alarmed sinners. And the Apostles' Creed is all about what God has done for you. Now, a few years back, I found this on a blog site, and it's just quite the story. A charismatic, a Presbyterian, and a Lutheran walk into a bar. Okay, that probably would never happen. But if those three people were somehow to enter a bar, coalesce, and emerge from the establishment as one man who realized he wasn't too fond of beer to begin with, we'll wonder about his Lutheran credentials there, that one man could possibly be me. Yes, many denominations have made an impact on my spiritual development, he says. And while I could possibly be labeled as something of a Reformed charismatic, 
which I assure you is not a contradiction in terms, he says. I have also been heavily influenced by the teachings of Martin Luther. One Lutheran doctrine in particular has been especially helpful, the paradigm-shattering distinction between law and gospel. He, he real, Yeah, I was reflecting on Wesley's conversion experience where it was f- from hearing the introduction to Luther's commentary on Romans read at Aldersgate. I really wish he would have stayed, Wesley would have stayed for the rest of it. But that's just me. This fellow continues, as any Lutheran worth his salt will tell you, this distinction is critical for properly understanding the Bible. The law is defined as any imperative statement, that is, a command to do or not do something. The gospel, on the other hand, is an indicative statement, a promise that God has accomplished or will accomplish. Throughout Scripture, God speaks with the voice of either the law or the gospel, and we need to discern discern which voice is speaking whenever reading a verse or passage. Pretty simple, right? While the concept itself is simple, understanding and believing and applying it is not so simple. We must understand that the law shows us what we ought to do, not what we can do. God designed the law to act as our tutor, to show us just how wide a gap exists between what we must accomplish and what we cannot accomplish. Then, when we see our plight for what it truly is, the gospel steps in and promises that God has done what we could not. If we interpret the law of God as being attainable through human effort, we will misinterpret countless scriptural passages. Or think about the gospel, a word that in the Greek means good news. As has been explained by men much wiser than I, there's a big difference between good news and good advice. The gospel is the former, not the latter. It is the story of the finished work that God has accomplished on our behalf apart from our help or assistance or merit. The gospel is not a command, but we often interpret it as such. Just the other day, I heard a lady describe the gospel as being about what we should and shouldn't do. That's good advice, not good news. Law, actually. And good advice has no power to save a sinner trapped by the condemnation of the law. One particular aid I found for discerning law gospel distinctions is the Lutheran Study Bible. My favorite quote from this whole thing is, Lutherans know something we don't know. And I pray that he is blessed by more of uh, what Luther has to say. That was 2013. I should probably check in on him again. So what do you do when you find a book where law and gospel are messed up? You need a stamp. Heretical garbage for research purposes only. I had one of those made for my library. So here's what I recommend as resources on law and gospel. Everything here is on the handout uh, in addition to some things we'll spend a whole lot more time on here. Scripture. Walther's Law and Gospel. I uh, found a Bible case I couldn't live without. This is a reminder for me not to fumble when doing Law and Gospel. I just see this on the shelf when I'm writing my sermon, and uh, it's always a good reminder. I've included Luther's 1532 sermon, The Distinction Between the Law and the Gospel, in your handout. Really good overnight reading. Uh, You can consider it for your personal devotion tonight before you go to bed. The Lutheran Confessions. Do not neglect Luther's small catechism with explanation. In fact, the explanation updated proposed revision is on Synod's website right now. Luther's works, especially the sermons. You'll hear Luther talk about the law and the promises. A good example of applying that uh, law and gospel that way is President Harrison's third part of his presentation, his president's report to the Synod Convention, where he talks about the gates of hell shall not prevail. It was true then, and he gives you all kinds of historical references, and it's still true now. But because it comes off as law, all of these horrible statistics and 
and things in Luther's life that he quotes, he focuses on the promises. And he shares a promise and then asks, do you believe it? And by the end, it becomes believe it. And uh, good stuff there. And Lutheran hymnody and liturgy. We have a great taste of that with chapel here on campus. And uh, at least in the PowerPoint, you'll get to see some recommended hymns there. Other things that you should probably have in your personal library, the Lutheran Study Bible. There's an icon that has two tablets and a cross that will help you with law gospel understanding and application in the study notes. Very similar with the Apocrypha Lutheran edition with notes. Lutheran service book. This is awesome. This is Pless's book, Handling the Word of Truth. The uh, 2004 edition has a slightly different cover. This is the updated one that uses um, the updated Law and Gospel translation. Yes, sir. Just one other uh, good resource that's inexpensive also, because you really pay for that, uh, is Luther's Hidden 35 Traditions. There you go. Yeah. Very and and it's cheap. this fella who does the Art of Law and Gospel has his mini book. He's got selections from Galatians to get people warmed up to Luther. Really good stuff. If you haven't read The Hammer of God, this is the novel by Bo Geertz, that would be a good read for you. And try to find the 2005 edition because it has an extra last chapter. And it helps flesh out because you've got this little triptych, 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 triptych. And it, it finishes it off uh, in, in a very nice way. And with uh, a little asterisk for your warning, uh, Ed Kaler's A Christian Pedagogy, He's got some really neat things for parents and teachers on law and gospel, but he's essentially progressive in his other pedagogical methods, which is LCMS 1930 right there. Um, I'm not going to make you sing today, but do consider hymn 579, The Law of God is Good and Wise, and of course right after that Lutheran service book is 580. We're going to begin in the explanation part of Luther's small catechism. What does God teach and do in the law? In the law, God commands good works of thought, word, and deed, and condemns and punishes sin. And what we're used to seeing is after that, the Bible verses that are the source of this teaching. I noticed something over the last year in teaching a young man coming to our congregation from the wells. Luther says in the preface to the small catechism, pick one translation and stick with it. So we stuck with their translation for the rest of his catechesis, and then he joined our larger eighth grade class where we read through the large catechism. That's how we do catechesis in Sheridan. And I noticed something. In the Wells explanation part, they ask the question, they have the Bible verses, and then they have the summary answer. And I've always found that to be interesting. Mark 12, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And always remember the law always accuses, it cuts, it condemns. It is not friendly in that way. What does God teach and do in the gospel? In the gospel, the good news of our salvation in Jesus Christ, God gives forgiveness, faith, life, and the power to please him with good works. The familiar John 3.16 actually talks about the gospel, but uh, we can apply it to ourselves. Where alone does God offer the forgiveness of sins? Only in the gospel. What's the difference between the law and the gospel? Well, there's an A, which tells you there's more than one part. The law teaches what we are to do and not to do. The gospel teaches what God has done and still does for our salvation. Part B, the law shows us our sin and the wrath of God. 
The gospel shows us our Savior and the grace of God. Uh, I was raised partially with Kurth's catechetical helps, and it has SOS for both. Shows our sin and shows our Savior as a mnemonic device. The law must be proclaimed to all people, but especially to impenitent sinners. The gospel must be proclaimed to sinners who are troubled in their minds because of their sins. So in a way, we afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. How carefully does God want us to keep his commandments? I know it's in the back of the catechism because some kid asked this at some point, but usually adults want to know, well, which ones can I get away with? God wants us to keep his commandments perfectly, be whole. But this is not possible because of our sinful human nature. Can anyone be saved by the law? No, it is not possible, which breaks our hearts when we see so many Christians who try to do it or whose church bodies obscure the gospel to such a point that all you have left is law. Yeah. What need is there for Jesus? Exactly. If you water the law down so it's achievable, you don't need Jesus. And that's one of the ways of, of messing up law and gospel. The second article of the creed gives us very clear teaching on what Jesus has done for us especially the personal application to us in the what does this mean? We hear of Jesus Christ, his person and work, and when he saves us, he's doing his name. Jesus means the Lord saves. And let's skip ahead just a bit. The rest of the Lutheran confessions, in addition to the small catechism, are a rich treasure trove, often not um, folks that aren't pastors aren't aware of, but teachers and lay people need to be. So this is uh, from the Formula of Concord, the epitome. There are two parts to that document. The gospel is properly the kind of teaching that shows what a person who has not kept the law and is therefore condemned by it is to believe. It teaches that Christ is paid for and made satisfaction for all sins. Christ is gained and acquired for an individual without any of his own merit, forgiveness of sins, righteousness that avails before God and eternal life. The term gospel is not used in one and the same sense in the Holy Scriptures. That's why this disagreement originally arose. Therefore, we believe, teach, and confess that if the term gospel is understood to mean Christ's entire teaching that he proposed in his ministry, as his apostles did also, then it is correctly said and written that the gospel is the preaching of repentance and the forgiveness of sins. Pointing out also that the Old Testament term a law or law yes. used in the broad sense that he was also teaching of the forgiveness Indeed. When it's the whole counsel of God. So Lutherans define their terms. That's what we're trying to do here as we get started together. We need to know whether we're talking about the wide sense or the very specific common sense of both law and gospel. So there's hymn 580, the gospel shows the Father's grace. These two hymns can be sung separately, one after another, or one of the more creative ways that you can do it is sing stanza of 579 and then sing stanza one of 580. And we attempted that a couple of times at the St. Louis Seminary when I was there. And it was well worth the effort. We end up with a really, really long, good hymn that way. So for the next couple of days, uh, if you would, bring your Bible. Uh, hopefully from the bookstore or the CPH booth, you can get a copy of Law and Gospel. And hopefully Pless's book, this would be good. And if you would tonight, read Luther's sermon on the distinction between law and gospel. Uh, I have it on our CCLE 13 page as a PDF from the first time. 
And if you have this book, it's in the appendix. Also, take a read through Galatians, Romans, and Luther's lectures on Galatians are wonderful. Probably the best uh, New Testament Greek class that I had at the seminary was when we read through Galatians in the original Greek. And it was work, because that was the first time that we had done that after readings class. Oh, oh, it, it, it made us feel rather good. There's another little book uh, from Concordia Publishing House called God at Work, Changing Lives by Teaching Law and Gospel. I have to have an ing word in the subtitle for some reason. This is not to be confused with Dr. Gene Edward Veet's book, God at Work by Crossway, but this is designed in 34 different articles to give you something, basically a law gospel explanation slash devotion for faculty meetings. And I could see this as a, a good resource for you. It's uh, by committee, essentially. So you've got Burkhardt plus... Fikensher, uh, Sonnenberg, Sink, Bile. You've got quite a few folks that we would trust to do something like that. All right. And this is what Walther's book usually looks like. Here's mine. If you don't know this fellow, uh, C.F.W. Walther was the first president of the LCMS and of the St. Louis Seminary. And uh, if, if you put glasses on him, he looks a little bit like Al Berry, but nowhere as good looking as Al Berry was. What we're going to do in our session here is look at his theses that come from a series of lectures. They called them the Luther Hour Lectures, which led to a radio show that you've probably heard of. And this was Walther's time where, when he let down his hair and talked in German rather than the academic and usual seminary instruction language of Latin. Um, he follows a common way of doing theology where he develops a thesis, assertion based on scripture as a whole. Then he proves the assertion using Bible texts, quotes from the creeds and confessions and church fathers and mm -hmm. theologians. For Luther, the distinction between the law and the gospel is not a theoretical identification of specific texts as either law or gospel. Instead, it is a functional distinction that is critical for pastoral diagnosis of a person's spiritual condition before God. That's from another Pless book, Martin Luther, Preacher of the Cross. All right, so... Within your handout, you can see all of the theses. And what I've done here is I'll give you all of the theses. The most important ones, in my opinion, are the first and the last. Uh, the last one being, you're not rightly distinguishing law and gospel in the word of God if you do not allow the gospel to pre predominate in your teaching. And plus, organizes these into um, ways to mess things up. He gives some different categories through his chapters. So I'll give you the bracket ideas from the new edition of Law and Gospel, as well as Pless's overview. One, the doctrinal contents of all Holy Scripture, both of the Old and the New Testament, consist of two doctrines that differ fundamentally from each other, these doctrines are the law and the gospel. Now, I have this fantasy, and perhaps my theology of glory is that I want to do a presentation like this, a Bible study on law and gospel, with my local ministerial association. Because mostly it's a group of Baptists or Baptists who won't call themselves Baptists and me, and then there's the other group which has the Catholics, the Mormons, the Unitarians, and um, the other mainline churches. And I don't really fit in either. But uh, more on thesis one. 
These two doctrines differ as regards the matter of their being revealed to man. Law on your heart, law on the commandments, only the gospel is revealed. You may hear people saying, well, I like to commune with God out in nature. Well, will a bird tell you the gospel? Will a bear tell you that Jesus died on the cross for you? No, it's a very law-based environment. And the two doctrines differ as regards their contents. The gospel gives comfort. Uh, the law does not. These two doctrines differ as regards the promises held out by either doctrine, and they differ in what they threaten. The gospel is unique. It does not threaten anything. Think about how the Reformed speak of baptism and the Lord's Supper. They're often referred to as ordinances, right? We refer to them as sacraments, and we have to define what sacrament means as opposed to the Catholic definition of sacrament. But ordinance is a law word, and ordinances are passed by your city council. And they hand out stuff that people need to do and obey, not good news. It usually means an increase in the city budget. These two doctrines differ as regards the function and the effect of either doctrine. Regarding the law, it tells us what to do, but does not enable us to comply. You will hear all kinds of preachers, especially on TV and the internet and now Sirius XM radio. There's a Joel Osteen channel. God help us. Where the preachers assume that the law, because God says do this, you can do it. Well, that's a misunderstanding of the Bible. The law shows us our sin, but does not reveal to us a way out of them. And the law produces contrition, but without gospel, it leads to despair. This will be a very important point of contact um, when I do a presentation in September in Utah. We've got five LCMS schools in the Utah circuit of the Rocky Mountain District. They want me to come out and explain classical ed to them. All together, five. Yeah, Ty Bramwell was at Rock Springs. He was confirmed uh, by Pastor Holtus. I was his vacancy pastor. That congregation sent me to CCLE 5 in Laramie in 2003 to help out their preschool. And that's how I got involved in this whole deal. Now he's a pastor at Christ Murray with a congregation of his own and a school and he's got the first hurdle done. He has a classical teacher on the faculty, his bride. They want to go classical. So I think that with Roswell and with Utah, we can kind of pincer and then call upon you. And I mean, imagine a Rocky Mountain District church workers event on classical education. That used to be a thought of a theology of glory, but it might actually happen now, under a cross, of course. So here's how the gospel is different from the law regarding function and effect. The gospel demands and gives faith. The preaching of that, the Holy Spirit, delivers faith, which receives all of the other gifts. The gospel removes terror and fills one with peace and joy. The gospel requires nothing but gives all. So who's the audience? The law is always preached in its full severity to those who are carnally secure. We don't use that kind of phrase phraseology anymore. Maybe we should again. Those who don't think they're doing anything wrong. Those who need to repent. The gospel is proclaimed to alarm sinners who desire to know the way of salvation. Note that once someone is alarmed, you don't just let them stew in their juices. Whether you're a pastor and it's the point where church discipline has done its job. I'm currently in the middle of four church discipline situations and it is agonizing. Ages from the 20s to the 80s. 
And it's the worst part about being a pastor. But there is something worse than that, being unfaithful. Um, The gospel is proclaimed to alarm sinners who desire to know the way of salvation, and it is such a sweet, wonderful privilege to preach. We preach the law as if there is no gospel and then preach the gospel as if there is no law. Which brings us to thesis two. Pless calls this the high and hard art. Rather eloquent. If you wish to be an orthodox teacher, you must present all the articles of faith in accordance with scripture, yet you must also rightly distinguish law and gospel. And in my theoretical uh, presentation to my local ministerial association, I think I'd be in trouble already. I'm pretty sure I would be. Because when it comes to conversion, they're all of one mind and I'm of another. When it comes to sacraments, they're all of one mind, I'm of another. And there are so many of them, a majority of them, do not have any kind of organized training in order to do the jobs that they're doing. You must also rightly distinguish law and gospel. Scripture is very rich on this importance. Uh, You can see the wide number of Bible verses that Walter himself gets into there. What's so dangerous, though, about deviating from biblical truth. You're separated from Christ. You're leading people away from forgiveness, life, and salvation in Jesus. And then, of course, on distinguishing from each other the law and the gospel, it's very telling to see how Walther does this. Uh, Yes. Right. Right. And it's it's like he had uh, Vorms on his mind. You know, here I stand, I can do no other unless I'm convinced by Scripture or clear reason. We had the joy at our congregation. We have a new... Uh, Bible class. We call it Thursday Night Theology. It's a lot like what the guys, the pastors and elders do up in Billings with their cigars and pints in the in the garage uh, and read through the bondage of the will over and over. We read through Small Cult and we have one more session to finish out the treatise on the power and primacy of the Pope. And it was just eye-opening because people were wanting more. They were wanting steak with bacon wrapped around it. And so we need to read more Luther. So we, we very much enjoyed hearing about justification and how all of these other controversies deny something about Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And you pair that with that CCM opinion that allowed someone not to be in trouble if their ecclesiastical supervisor gave them permission, it can only lead to chaos. Yeah. I, I don't know how. I thought 1201 this time could have restored the right to appeal. But the 1214 compromise, I pray for a godly solution, but I'm still not quite satisfied until I see what it's going to be. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yep. And so it had to be it had to be a parish pastor who drove all the way to Indiana where he was teaching and filling a pulpit part time to have that face to face before charges could be brought. And it just happened to be a parish pastor who was also the Montana district president and the best mustache in the synod by convention vote. He got 58% of the vote on being the best mustache. But because he's a parish pastor, the compromise was that over the next six months, the Council of Presidents and the Board of Directors will come up with a fix. The compromise was the convention empowered those two groups to, to deal with it. So, as I said before, I'm not satisfied yet, but I am relieved at some of the, the skeleton that finally got buried. AC-14. I was I was there at 04 and 07 and 10 and 13. I didn't have to go this time, which was a relief. But just to see how many more pages of the handbook are we giving district presidents to do so that they could only rarely also be, um, say, an assistant pastor with a pulpit font, altar shut-ins, and regular preaching duties. Um, Perhaps smaller districts would be in order, but we, there's always work to do, and uh, we need one another to call one another to repentance and back to the purposes of having a synod in the first place, and ecclesiastical su supervision for the sake of walking together was one of them. Circuit visitors now, instead of counselors. You go to a counselor, but a visitor comes to you. And I really like that. More on the high and hard art in Thesis 3. To rightly distinguish law and gospel is the most difficult and highest art. And for theologians in particular, it is taught only by the Holy Spirit in combination with experience. Now, I'm going to go back a slide because under Thesis 2, Walther found uh, this good quote. When they arrive at the university, they know everything. In their second year of study, they become aware of some things they do not know. At the close of their last year of study, they're convinced that they know nothing at all. If only that were still true. But we do have that know-it-all culture going on now. In commenting on Galatians 2, Luther says, Let anyone who knows well how to distinguish the law from the gospel thank our Lord God, for he can easily pass for a theologian. In my tribulations, I did not, alas, understand this as I should have. It's just a continuing work. Um, thank God for the gifts of his word and spirit. Pray that the Holy Spirit will enlighten your heart and mind as you search the scriptures. Thesis 4 echoes more of Thesis 1, that there are two different doctrines. When understanding how to distinguish law and gospel, uh, understanding how to distinguish law and gospel provides wonderful insight for understanding all of Holy Scripture correctly. In fact, without this knowledge, Scripture is and remains a sealed book. I've heard how many times, basic information before leaving earth, Bible. It just sounds law to me. Or principles. Having Dr. Nagel so much at St. Louis, that was one of the benefits of St. Louis, uh, really ingrained in me that principle is a law word, that if you distill something just to that, you filter out all of Jesus. Yeah, 
doable law. I haven't found the best way to work um, a critique of the St. Louis Two Kinds of Righteousness into this yet. But we did have a speaker, Beerman, come personally. And uh, I bought the book and, and read his book and was... Yeah, toward a Lutheran virtue ethic. That's, it's, it ends up being law. So here's a couple of quotes from the Lutheran Confessions. First, the apology or defense of the Augustana. For rightly to understand the benefit of Christ and the great treasure of the gospel, which Paul extols so greatly, we must separate it as far as the heavens are from the earth, the promise of God and the grace that is offered on the one hand, from the law on the other. And again, the formula of concord, epitome, we believe, teach, and confess that the distinction between the law and the gospel is to be maintained in the church with great diligence as an especially brilliant light by which, according to the admonition of St. Paul, the word of God is rightly divided. And he's talking about the Timothy passage right there. Another hymn for your consideration, these are the Holy Ten Commands. This is, what, the third hymnal that I've um, personally used. I grew up with TLH. I was exposed to Lutheran worship for the first time as a hymnal at my campus ministry before they got rid of it for the rock band. There's a long story there. Um, But... The Lutheran Service Book version at 581 is the first one that actually sounds like it's a hymn about the Ten Commandments. So you have the introductory stanza there in one, the first commandment in stanza two, but by the end, you can tell it's a Luther hymn because in stanza 11, he says, you can't keep it, and in stanza 12, you can't keep it, and we have to flee to Christ. Perhaps uh, 579 has a lot more gospel in its final stanzas than than these two, but a good one to sing as well. So next up, 21 ways to mess this up, to confuse law and gospel. What are the two main teachings of Holy Scripture? I ask this of my student body uh, during a more interactive uh, sermon at least a couple times a year. And this young lady stood up, as our scholars do, and answered, Law and Gospel, Pastor Cain. Her father, She's no longer with our school. They moved away. But her father was part of an antinomian contemporary church in town. So at least I got through to her. Uh, Later, I'll tell you what it's like to have a Seventh-day Adventist parent and the wife of that antinomian pastor try to discipline children on the playground at the same time. Doesn't work out too well. A complete disaster. We also heard this about the incident. You can't punish my daughter. It's been too long since it happened. Okay, the girl gets in trouble on the playground, is clearly in the wrong. Even both of those parents agree, even though barely any gospel, barely any law. And she was mysteriously sick the next day of school, that Friday, and then was away on a family vacation for a week. And this is why we couldn't punish her daughter. Yes, yes. In the 5th through 25th theses, Dr. Walther singles out specific problems with not properly distinguishing law and gospel. This is not splitting theological hairs not when they impact your salvation. Is one despairing over the law without the hope of any gospel? Is one secure in the works of the law, not needing Christ or his gospel? That's what we're getting into in the next 
theses. So um, we have two more hours together over the next two days, and we will take a look at theses 5 through 25 in that time. So uh, let's end on time, but I will see if there's any questions. You've been... You haven't been shy to speak up, so I'm, I encourage that in my Bible classes back home. Um, so, thank you. thank you very much for thank your you. attention. And we'll see you later today, around and about, and tomorrow for part two.